And of course, Jennifer's a longtime favorite. I won't call her an old favorite. <laughs> if I want her to come back. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, good morning. My name is Reverend Alice Reed, and I'm glad to be with you again this morning on another Sunday in October. Yes, October, a wonderful time of year. The weather changes and we have uh, an opportunity to watch the transitioning of the world in, in the form of nature. Even here in Southern California, the flora and the fauna begin to make their transition into winter time uh, for what it is <laughs> in Southern California. <laughs> Um, having grown up on the East Coast where we had four seasons, even you can, you can bring the East Coast girl to Southern California, but you can't make her forget the seasons. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm happy to be here with you today. And um, we are in week three of our Let Your Love Ripple Outward Committed Giving program. And so um, many of you as you walked in the door, received, uh, you know, a program with all the fun things we're doing this month. You also received a commitment card. Um, uh, I want to let you know that this is your opportunity to either tell us that you're going to be continuing to commit us, to commit to us at whatever financial level you have been, or perhaps it needs to adjust upward or downward. But whatever you put on the card, will supersede what, you, what we have on file for you. Um, so not to worry, not to worry. This is really, this really helps us because we're doing our budgeting. And I, <clears throat> and I want to sort of weave this into the town hall meeting that we had last Sunday after our celebration service, where we looked at our values and um, looked at some of the things that challenged us and began to, and, and one of the really interesting things that came up and bubbled up as I was facilitating that conversation with our board president, Jody Charton, um, was that you said you want it all. <laughs> <laughs> you really said you wanted it all. And then you said you wanted some more, <laughs> right? And so, I encourage you to fill out those cards so that we know what your commitment is, what's the investment that you want to make. You know, somebody uh, asked somebody in another meeting I was at, how do we grow our movement? We grow our movement by investing in it. And so I hope that you'll invest in this community, which is also investing in your own spiritual path, which is also investing in the the rippling outward that we do in um, the greater community and which eventually affects the world. Because, you know, we, we think in these big ideas about how the world has to change, but honestly, it changes one moment, one behavior, one action at a time. And your financial gifts here, your contributions, your investments really make a difference. So thank you. I, um, <clears throat> if you have any questions, if you have any concerns at all, you can talk to myself or Reverend Karen. Either one of us will try to help you with that. So just a, you know, a little top notes about our, um, our committed, no, our town hall meeting. <laughs> uh, um, the top three values, as I I did some synthesizing and bringing them forward and trying to boil it down to the top three things. The top three things you really value are inspiration, community, and programming. And inspiration included things like ministerial staff and the inspirational messages. Community represented, you know, I heard you, you labeled it in so many different ways. Spiritual family, friendship, safe place to be, being an inclusive community. And then in programming, you talked about our music and our teaching center, you talked about our youth and the things that we do to support young people as the, and families as they're coming up in the world. And so these are the top three values that we have. And so those are the things that you'll be investing in. And um, there is a, a larger version of a summary that I did of all the 
things that came up at our town hall meeting, and you can see it on the kiosk on your way out. And um, Pam, we'll put that on the website maybe so that people can also see it there. Because it's, it's nice to begin to uh, you know, focus on the things that are important to us and begin to see ourselves in community and the things that we value. So this um, month, uh, well, this year, we're living out loud. And uh, this month, we're playing with paradox. And today, we're talking about shaking up your worldview. And so today, I want to talk about paradox. I want to talk about racism. I want to talk about the conflict in the Middle East. And I want to weave it into this idea of shaking up our worldview, and um, I'm going to bring in uh, Sean Ginwright's book, The Four Pivots. The, subti the subtitle of this book is Reimagining Justice and Reimagining Ourselves. And what I found with this book, we've been studying it, um, I mentioned it about a year or so ago here. We've been studying it at the global CSL level. We've been doing a book study with ministers and practitioners, about 150 of us meet once a week to go through each chapter. And what I found is that the same principles and approaches that Sean Ginwright uses for um, the four pivots apply, they apply to social justice, they apply to world, world conflict, they apply to centers like ours that are looking at what is our next yet to be. And so I'm going to share a little bit about that as we, as we look at um, all of these things and how they come together. And so paradox is described as this um, way of looking at two disparate ideas and finding the connection, right? You have to give it away to keep it. You have to surrender to win. Two different ideas that actually there's some common ground in the middle. And, it, and I know it's abstract, right? It's very abstract to look at these paradoxes. And, and so if I applied it to our teaching, we have a teaching that's open at the top, that talks about evolu you know, an evolutionary process that we tap into that is forever evolving and changing. And then you, you hear uh, our practitioners and ministers pray, and, and they say, I know this, and I know that, and I know the other thing. And so how, if you know something, how does it change? How do we evolve, right? I think it's a little bit of a paradox in and of itself. And so I wanted to read to you, <coughs> excuse me, I wanted to read to you the Reverend Chris Alexander, who's a young minister in uh, Virginia, and she writes, the science of mind is a spiritual philosophy founded on Ernest Holmes' ability to stay curious and vulnerable. His voracious appetite for knowledge and understanding led him on an incredible journey of curiosity that we continue to benefit from by staying open at the top and looking at the many paradoxes of, li paradoxes of life and our of our science of mind teaching, we can, excuse me, we continue earnest legacy and journey in a new way, allowing ourselves to utilize this teaching to stay in the question rather than the answer. So my initial inquiry, how do we stay open in the top if we know the answer, <laughs> right? <laughs> how do we do that? Well, I think it's by exploring our thinking. I think it's by looking at um, the, the places where we get stuck, maybe a little too comfortable. And in Sean Ginwright's book, he has four pivots that we can look at to help shake up our worldview. The first um, one is awareness. He says that we, we move from lens, looking out into the world, to looking at ourselves. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? to a lot of the things that we teach here within the music that, uh, you know, the words of the song that we sang as a community as we started. We need to, we come back in and we notice how we're looking out into the world and projecting our, um, our own 
maybe uh, less than uh, positive ideas, our judgments. We tend to, to project them outward, and so the mirror has us come back and see where those things live inside us. His second pivot is connection, where we move from transactional to transformational relationships. Transactional relationships are <clears throat> those relationships where we, we focus on what's on the surface. What, are, what am I going to do for you and what are you going to do for me? Where transformational relationships really begin to have us look at each other and experience each other and listen to each other and to begin to embrace the different experiences we have and the different viewpoints, the different opinions, if you will, so that we can begin to um, have a greater perspective. The third pivot is vision from problem fixing to possibility thinking, and I'm actually going to dive into that one a little more today. And the fourth one is presence from hustle to flow. Anybody feel like you're hustling all the time? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe if you're retired or in your second or third career, it might not feel like quite the hustle. But um, gosh, sometimes just getting the trash out on Wednesday nights is a hustle for me. So uh, this, that fourth pivot is really looking at how we can step into the flow. And so I really want to look at vision today and, and <coughs> moving from problem fixing to possibility thinking. And I want to start by saying, hello, my name is Alice and I'm a problem lover. <laughs> and, you know, and let me give you some context for that because I don't necessarily love problems. But boy, can I live in the thinking about them, in the wanting solutions for them, but, but awfulizing or, or, you know, really looking at how difficult things are. Sean writes in his book that, uh, you know, he works with a lot of um, change agents. He works with a lot of people who are working with a social change. And he talks about working with students who are there. They're, they're resisting something. They're fighting something. They're, you know, they're struggling with something. Uh, whatever the issue might be. And when we find ourselves in that place of really wrestling with the problems of the world or even the problems of our, in our own center or the problems in our own lives, we, we become problem lovers. We become so saturated with the problems that we can't see the, any newness. We, we, we aren't, we're not able to, to really reach out into a new idea. We might try to uh, recast the situation in some way. We might try to rearrange the circumstances a little bit, but we don't really step in the newness when we are continually spinning in the issues of the day. That doesn't mean that uh, we don't need to fight for uh, a more just society. I'm not saying that. But at some point, we need to pause so that we can have vision to see past the issues of today. I, look, I, you know, I know that the, the problems in the world are big. We, um, you know, just looking at what's going on in the Middle East and the, the terrorizing that's happening because people are so invested in their, what they're not getting, what they don't have, what they think is theirs, the problems that they manifest themselves in the violence. And it's hard to watch. And, it, and it's hard to know what to do. It's hard to know how to move through that. And we started this service with all these lovely songs about loving ourselves and feeling, you know, positivity and, and um, all those beautiful ideas. Uh, and what does that have to do with the, the conflict in the Middle East? How, how can we sit here and talk about loving ourselves when people are dying, being kidnapped, being bombed in their, in their own homes?
Well, if you look really closely at the words of that, those songs, it really talked about weeding out the places in us that stay stuck in othering, that stay stuck in projection and, and looking outward towards the problem as opposed to coming to a place of being centered, getting grounded in spirit, and being available to something new. Sean talks in his chapter on vision and from problem fixing to um, possibility thinking, he talks about how we get to this place that we're at. Whether we're talking about the conflict in the Middle East or whether we're talking about institutional racism in our country, he looks at this, it, it's, he refers to it as, a, as an iceberg and I think of it as layers that oftentimes when we get concerned about an issue, there's some kind of an event. The first layer of that iceberg is the event that comes up, that gets our attention, that, you know, tears at our heart, that um, where we want something different. And that event, um, you, you know, if you think about the, the war in the Middle East, if you think about what happened when um, the murder of uh, George Floyd, there was, there was this swelling of people who were ready to experience something different, who were ready to speak to the problems that we're experiencing and, and in, w in when, when it comes to racism in our country. And, and then as we get further and further away from that event, the din dies down, right? And we've seen that over and over again. We've seen that with the pandemic. We've seen that with 9-11. There is, th usually we get stirred up by an event and, and Sean talks about the thing that's underneath that is the pa our patterns. We have events that are triggered, that trigger our patterns, and, and these are patterns of, of being, patterns of, of the, the way we are over time. They're, they're the trends in our own uh, lifestyle and the way we, we conduct ourselves in the world. He says the next layer under that is structures. And which are the relationships to our patterns. And then underneath all of that, down at the bottom, and I would say even though we talk about cause being, you know, we have this V and the teaching symbol where it's cause, um, seed, soil, and the plant, ca causation, law, and the form. But Sean's talking about what, what is it that's underneath everything? And that is our mental models, which are our assumptions, our beliefs, and the values that we hold. And it's hard to get to that place, right? Because we're up here reacting to events as opposed to looking at the mental models that we hold. And he uses some really um, wonderful examples of this where he uh, tries to look at our perspective with all of this. And I think the funny thing about perspective is that you only can see what you can see. You know, it's that old story of the blind man and the elephant, right? And the one blind man has the trunk and, and, or one of the legs and he says, oh, it's a tree. It's a strong and sturdy tree. And one person feels the ears and says, oh, it must be a winged beast. It's, it, we have this perspective because each of us looks at the world through our own world view. Each of us has our own viewfinder. Each of us has our own experiences that cause us to look at the world the way we do. And so in order to shake up our world view, we need to look at what it is that is our perspective and be curious about the other perspective. Be curious about the, 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 the things that are happening in the world. If you, you, you whether you are a Democrat or a Republican, whether you are supporting Palestine or is Israel, whether you believe there's institutional racism or, <coughs> or that, that, that it's just a lot of um, people who don't know how to take care of themselves, um, whatever vantage point you have, I encourage you to be curious about the other ways of seeing things. And the, the reason isn't to adopt 
a new worldview, the reason is to shake up your worldview, to begin to question what it is that you see out in the world and to begin to help your mind to open up to new ideas. Excuse me. <coughs> If, if we are going to, if we are going to create a world that works for all, this is really a big vision. It's a beautiful vision. I, I don't believe we continue. To, we can continue to do the same thing and expect different results. In order for us to step into possibility thinking and design thinking, it's. It, it's, we need to stretch our minds, and we do that through paradoxes. We do that through this, these ideas of how we can really show up in the world. And, and then to ask ourselves, what is ours to do? I have no idea how to directly impact what's going on in Israel and uh, the Gaza Strip and Palestine. Uh, but I do know that I can look within myself for those places that think small, that believe that somebody's going to take something from me, believe that I'm going to lose mine, and to press in and look at what needs to be healed within myself, and then to act from that place of greater awareness and perspective, and whether that is <coughs> supporting a charity that is feeding those that that don't have resources, or maybe it's you know supporting the uh, the medical doctors, or or supporting uh, peace efforts financially, um, or perhaps supporting peace efforts right here at home. There was a wonderful um, document that went out from Centers for Spiritual Living. We emailed it out to you on Friday, and it really gave you some resources for how to how to show up in a spiritually centered way. I, my friends, <laughs> I don't think the world's going to get simpler. <laughs> I don't. And, and when I say to you glibly, hello, my name is Alice and I'm a problem lover, I'm owning the fact that it's easier for me to sit in the problem than it is to begin to do my spiritual practice and to begin to think a new thought, to begin to use my imagination for a different idea, a different way of being, a, 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 a newness that can help us to reimagine ourselves. And Sean says that we, he calls this thing the third position, and he says usually we have three, three positions we can take. We can take the first position, which often is that place where we hold an idea and we give it, we believe it's credible, we believe it's true, and we stand firmly in whatever that first position is. Second position usually challenges first position with its own ideas about credibility and value and truth. Third position is this place of neutrality where you try to be curious about first position and second position. And I'm not, let me just take that from the abstract into, like, if we were talking about gun control, right? If we were talking about gun control, first position might be the, um, the, the Second Amendment, right, and the right to bear arms. The, um, the, the second position might be well, I certainly believe in that constitutional amendment, but I, but I don't think we should be able to have AK-57s and automatic weapons. And the third position tries to look at, at with curiosity at both positions as opposed to getting into the game of competing for who's right. And so the way that we begin to first step into possibility thinking is being willing to surrender the need to be right. Not to, not to take on somebody else's worldview, but to question our own. I really believe the world is, is calling for us to do this really important work, and it may not feel like work because it's very much in our hearts and in our minds, 
but it is the work of loving, loving unconditionally, of listening, of being curious, of suspending our judgment. And, and Sean says in very plain English, and I agree with him, holding third position, <laughs> this is not an easy task. I had to hold third position at our town hall meeting. Um, I, I think I did a good job. I think I was about, I think I was about 80% there, <laughs> but that 20%, <laughs> it was bubbling up. It was bubbling up because I have, you know, I have, there were a couple things that came up and I felt like defensive about it, right? That's, what, that's when we lose our third position and start to drop into first or second position when we allow our defensiveness to come forward. Uh, we, we need, in order for us to move from, from point A to point B, we've got to shake up our worldview, friends. It, it is really time for us to begin to look at those places of, of shift that are necessary, whether they are in your own home, in this community, in the greater community, in the country or the world. It's really time for us to open up and be available to new ideas. And um, I really love, as I was reading um, about this, uh, this pivot in this wonderful book, I really enjoyed the work that he did in a community where everybody was sort of like, it's not going to change. <laughs> you know, he was working with community leaders in an impoverished area, and they were all buying for the same nonprofit dollars, and they were mistrusting each other, and they were... It's, none of this is ever going to change because this is just the way it is. There's too many problems. It's, it's, there's too much oppression. There's too much racism. There's not enough money. And, you know, they're getting all the money, but they're not doing all the work. They're doing all the work, and they don't have any money. I mean, it was... It's not hard to imagine, is it? <laughs> no, it's not hard to imagine that scenario like that. I've seen it over and over again. And the... The work is to begin to look at our languaging and how we hold things and how we problem love and to begin to imagine, well, here's our experience. What if, you know, one of the, one of the meetings he had, he talks about, what if there was enough money for us to have infrastructure in all the core or, you know, agencies here? And, and what if we could spend time suspending our our mistrust of each other and begin to really look at new possibility in this community. Those are the kinds of possibility thinking or design thinking that really bring us into a new way of being. And it, it, requi it requires that we have a faith in uncertainty. It requires that we have a faith in the, the unknown territory of newness. And it's hard, isn't it, to have faith in what we can't see? It's hard for us to, because I see all this happening over here, and we've got to change, and I've got to get involved in it. But what if there's a third position, a third way, a new way of seeing? And that's what we've been talking about all month with this idea of paradoxes, that there, if we can let go of the seemingly um, this is opposed to this and find that common ground, Howard talks about it as the alignment of our will and of the power of the universe. And when, they, when we are in alignment with God, if we are in alignment with spirit and, and we bring our will to that place, that is when the magic happens. That's when creation happens. That's when really juicy things can come up. But we have to be available for it. I'm going to, um, oh, I'm way over. <laughs> uh, that's a big topic. So I'm, uh, the kingdoms of consciousness, if you're not familiar with this model, I'm just going to talk about the four kingdoms, the, the way I see us moving through this change. The first kingdom is that place of victimization, and it generates fear. The second kingdom is that kingdom where we think we're powerful, we can fix everything. The third kingdom is that kingdom of faith where we trust that something larger than us is moving through us. And there's a distinct difference between kingdom two and kingdom three, but sometimes they can look the same. 
the, the difference really is that, that um, I'll call it an egoic attachment to what I'm trying to create and fix versus uh, trusting and allowing and letting be and, and raising my awareness so that I can see what's in front of me and the next right step to take. And the, f the fourth step is fruition, the kingdom four, as we, we, we move from fear to fixing to faith to actual demonstration. I know these are difficult ideas to grapple around, but we have to. We have to, we have to grapple with them. We, we can't expect to create a world that works for all if we're unwilling to be that place where love shows up. I was, the, I'll end with this, that there was, there's this wonderful uh, quote in the Bible from the master teacher Jesus as he's talking to his disciples. And he says, if you love each other, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And if I was to uh, metaphysicalize it, <laughs> He's simply saying, if you love each other, everyone will know love. If you love each other, everyone will know love. I want us to be that community. As we go through the town hall today, we're going to do some visioning after the service. We're going to, um, we're get, we've got some food for you, and we're going to do a spiritual practice that is designed to open up your your mind and and be that receptor of imagination and the the wonderful ideas of the of spirit that want to come through you. And I have a vision for our community that we are known for our love. That when people say Centers for Spiritual Living Capistrano Valley, that, that it creates such a deep ripple outward because not only do we love each other, but we love our community. And we find those connection points where we can... Um, to have greater awareness and where we can have greater connection and where we can have great vision and where we can have great presence. And that starts with the love that we have for each other and allowing that to ripple outward. It's a beautiful vision, and I think we're up to it. So uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us for this uh, Let Your Love Ripple Outward program. We've got one more week. And I, and I, I know, it feels like I'm stirring the pot, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely feel it as the pot stirrer, but I, I, I think it's worth it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes of it. Thank you very much. You. Okay. So let's pray and I'll be brief. There is only one power, and that power is love. That power is peace. That power is unity and wholeness. And I trust that that power so loves the world that it moves through each one of us to experience those things. And I know that as we move through this week, we open our hearts and open our minds to a, a new way of seeing, to true vision, that wants to come through us. And I know that that vision is perfect and whole, and it needs each one of us so that it can walk the world and be in our life by means of us. And so it is with great gratitude that I know this highest calling for each one, for our community, for our world, to love and to be that place where love shows up. And so we anchor this prayer by simply saying, and so it is. Thank you. <laughs>